Welcome everybody to today's Intelligent Property Investor Masterclass. Now, as I said last week, I am on the road, so it's still gonna be a little bit clunky. I'm not in my studio. But the reason I'm doing these webinars and, uh, and these masterclasses for everybody is so that you can be more intelligent, really understand what's going on. Not the mainstream media fear and hysteria that's out there, but really understanding what's happening economically so that you can make better decisions. And when you make better decisions, you get better results. And isn't that what really what we want to do from an investment portfolio? And specifically about property as well. Now look, if you're listening to this on a podcast, either on Spotify or on iTunes, I really, really encourage you to go across to my website and subscribe to these weekly updates because you get all of my charts. And I'll be sharing a lot of information on the charts, what's happening, um, what the latest figures are, what they mean for us as property investors. So let's get into the masterclass. I'll just share my screen for you here. All right. So what are we going to be covering today? Well, one of the things we're going to be covering is uh, we'll be going to have a look at interest rates. Now, there's been a lot of talk about interest rates going up. And I want to I want to talk about that. I want to talk about what it means for Australia. And uh, a lot of the, the talk is actually coming from the US. And I'll, I'll get onto that in a minute. I want to talk about which CBD is operating at a 14% capacity. Isn't that crazy? Our poor old CBDs have really hit it hard over the last year or so. I want to talk about how big global debt has actually become um, and what it means. So what is it, what's, what's, what has it grown to um, and what does it mean um, across the world economically? Because we can all, you know, obviously debt is something that we need to keep track of and we need to make sure that we are uh, on top of. But it's also something that's happening on a global basis. And I wanted to show you the d distinction there between the way we think about debt and our personal debt. And when you have an event like this and the whole world goes into debt, debt it has a very different connotation. And I want to talk about Sweden and why Sweden lost the uh, the government over a housing crisis, which obviously we seem to be having a little bit of that at the moment. So let's start with the Australian economy. Why interest rate cuts are further off than people think. All right. Well, this chart here shows, and I want, I'm going to go about this in a bit of a roundabout way because I want to talk about interest rates, but I want to talk to you about why there's such speculation about interest rates going up. Um, and I want to start here with unemployment. Now, unemployment, uh, you know, I've been showing you these figures over a number of weeks now, and you can see we're down to 5.1%. So that's really good. Fantastic. You know, it means that people are going back to work and people have got more money and they're spending more money, which means that they've got, you know, the business is making more money so they can, they can employ more people. And the whole thing goes round and round and round. That's a great story. But I actually want to get into underneath what's really happening and why this story is so amazing, because it's not what you think. Let's move on. Still on the uh, employment bandwagon, you can see there how massively we got into the negative, and I've criticised this in the past about why the um, job uh, job seeker and job keeper didn't come out at the same time. It would have avoided a lot of that big unemployment, as you can see there. But I want to draw your attention to the red line there, where you can see we've had a massive, massive month up for May. The June figures aren't out yet um, because we're not there yet. But the May figures, as you can see, were massively up. That's just the percentage change from a month to month basis. Unemployment, as I said, that's oh, gone wrong way. Um, uh, full-time employment is a big story as part of that as well because, uh, you know, it's all very well to put on casuals, but uh, when you start putting on a full-time employee, this is a really good story because our, our um, wage legislation and industrial relations and everything else shows that it's, you know, when you put on a full-time employee, you expect it to be for a long period of time. It's much, much harder to put off an employee if they are on full-time employment. Whereas with casuals and part times, um, you know, it's it's relatively easy to to move people along. So this this really shows a big confidence boost for uh, for businesses and how they see their future, which is very buoyant, which is a good thing. But this is the real story. Why is employment so strong right now? It's because our net migration 
is negative. So not only have we seen um, immigration cut to zero, but we've actually seen an exodus. So a lot of those, uh, those students and things that were here went home. We've seen the um, part-timers and, and those who are on uh, work visas and things like that, they've all gone home. So what it means is it's left a big hole. It's left a hole for employment here in Australia. And that's what you can see there in this chart. We can see the last three quarters have been a negative um, net overseas migration. So there's been more people leaving than have been coming to Australia. So what that's meant is that we've had this, this big hole. In fact, from quarter um, two to quarter four of 2020, we saw a net migration of minus 73, nearly 74,000 people. So that's a lot of people that, uh, you know, that have, have left jobs, basically. And that is another reason that's adding to the strong employment figures for Australians right now is because that's left a big hole. Now, the other thing to really note here is obviously Victoria. Look at Victoria. It is, it is massive. Um, you know, and uh, most of the exodus has been from Victoria and then secondly into New South Wales. Queensland comes in, comes in there at, at, sorry, secondly into Queensland and then into New South Wales. Now, this is no surprise. Obviously, um, most of the students and, um, you know, the, the, the uh, part-timers and things like that have come from Victoria. But this is a net overseas migration. We're seeing more people leaving Victoria than anywhere else. And obviously that's due to lockdowns. And I've been very, very vocal about my opinions on the Victorian state government and some of the stupid decisions that they have made. And I'm very concerned about the, uh, the most recent budget with the hikes in um, payroll tax and in stamp duty and land tax and how uh, that's going to flow on into big business. And, and I've warned it can actually mean that there may be consideration of big businesses moving their head offices out of Melbourne and into places like Sydney and Brisbane. Now, if that happens, it's going to leave a very big hole in Victoria. And that is, you know, it's going to take some some wooing of the big boys to keep them in the state. And I tell you, Victoria needs it. You know, these these ridiculous laws that they brought in with the last budget are, are ridiculous. I mean, I can't put it any other way. They're just they're just stupid. It was a stupid budget um, and that's going to hurt Victoria. And I'm not Victorian, but, you know, I'm very concerned about all the states and what it means across the board economically, but also from a housing perspective. You know, if, if the worst happened in Victoria, you're going to see a further exodus and jobs and other things. And it will take a very long time for Victoria to recover. Now, I'm not being... Um, alarmist here, I'm being cautionary. And uh, if anyone in the government's actually listening to this, for God's sake, take heed. I'm talking about the Victorian government here. Um, take heed because it's not there yet, and uh, but it, it could swing that way. Now, the other thing is I'm actually still very bullish on Victoria because they've been hit so hard. We've seen massive increases across the board in the other states. Um, particularly in New South Wales and Brisbane, Queensland, uh, or Southeast Queensland, really. Um, but uh, we haven't seen the the increases to the same level as the other states as we have in Victoria. So um, we need to. Uh, obviously, that means that there's an advantage there. They, you know, if if they swing the same way that the other states have, then Victoria is going to be, you um, know, you know, it's, it's in for a big run. So let's have a look at population change. Now, this is put out by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, and you can see there we went massively down last year. Um, we've uh, we've come up a little bit, but a lot of that, obviously, none of it is due to immigration because we haven't had any. This is this is another woeful story for Victoria. You can see here, thirty thousand people have left Victoria for somewhere else. Um, 31,000 have come to Queensland. So, you know, there's a lot of movement there. Uh, and, uh, you know, New South Wales is a bit of an increase there. WA is increased. South Australia is 1,500 people, barely anything. But what it means is, um, you know, again, Victoria is being hit. It's being hit because of the lockdowns, but it's being hit because of all the, um, the, the law changes that have happened over the, over the time there in Victoria. 
Now, I did show you this a few weeks ago, but I thought it was interesting since I'm talking about population and migration to bring it up again. Buried in the depths of the last federal budget was these three lines. Now, this is the net overseas migration for year ending 30 June, but it shows you the predictions of the government um, into 2022, 23, 24, 25 financial years. So you can see there that 2021, uh, 2020-2021 has seen a negative uh, immigration there of nearly 100,000 people. When we look at the financial year ending now in, um, sorry, uh, 20, 2019 to 2020 was uh, nearly 200,000 up. The financial year ending 2021 was nearly 100,000 down and the financial year ending um, uh, next year, they still expect to be down. So 2022, they're still expecting a down from a, uh, a net overseas migration, which is 77,000 people um, in the negative. But then, as you can see, we start to see the rebound in 2023, 100,000 up, close enough. Uh, 2024, nearly 200,000 up, and 2025, 235,000 up. So that is the expectation. Um, so they're expecting to open the borders in the second half of next year would be my call from what those figures read. Now, let me just put that into perspective from a housing, um, a housing market relationship. So right now, the housing market is growing massively because of the pent up demand that we have seen because of the regulations implemented by APRA from 2017 through to 2019, 2020, really, in mid-2019. Then we had the pent up demand all through COVID 2020. And now we're starting to see the release valve being let off. So uh, all of that pent up demand, and at the same time as we had that pent up demand, we had the supply chain going down because the big boys simply weren't weren't building. Um, you know, prices were going down. Why would they want to? Why would they want to get out there and, and create more projects and other things? So what that means is that um, we're going through that chewing up all of that pent up demand right now. Now we're into the halfway through 2021. We've really only got a year to go, in my opinion, before we start to see um, the borders start to open up again in the second half of, of next year. So the, the, the demand that is already there will last at least that long. I think it'll last longer than that, but uh, we simply aren't producing enough properties to meet that demand. Consequently, we've got this roll on effect and, uh, you know, that's going to carry th things through. It's going to continue to uh, boost the, the pricing and the, and the very much a seller's market at the moment right across the board in Australia. That's going to continue because of this pent up demand and because at the same time we had a reduction in supply and it just takes time to, to bring supply up to demand. Pricing is doing a little bit of that by going up, but people just going to more affordable areas and pushing the price up everywhere. A lot of people are rent vesting where they can't afford to to buy where they live, so they go and and buy where they can afford, which is a, a you know a good thing to do, particularly where where uh, rents are going crazy across the board, regional areas as well, um, and there's simply just not enough supply. That's the that's it. When you in economics, you talk about demand and supply curves. When demand is oversupplied, prices go up, and that's exactly what we're experiencing. But it's not just demand going up supply has been going down. So that gap has been widening and widening so that now we're starting to try and squeeze it a little bit, but we've got a long way to go. So prices will remain strong for some time. Now, by the time that demand actually gets taken up, we are going to see a double whammy. And the double whammy comes from opening the borders. Now, when the borders open, um, it will be most felt in places like Melbourne and Sydney. So for Melbourne and Sydney, we're going to see a continued upward shift in pricing, a second surge, if you like, due to migration. It may take a little while to kick in, but it's only going to be a matter of months. It's not going to be a matter of years. Uh, other places like um, Brisbane, um, Adelaide, less, you know, a less of an impact there, although they'll get the students back. Uh, Perth, not so much, but Perth is strong on the back of the mining industry. Darwin, not really, and Hobart, not really either. Canberra, definitely. So, you know, you kind of get the feel there that we're in for this second wave of um, positive pricing. 
uh, and it's going to come from from migration and that's really why i wanted to focus on migration um, this week i'll just go back to sharing my screen back over here all right so that's what that's what the budget is telling us as well and uh you know it's something if you've been listening to me for any length of time it's something that i predicted last year um and it's all playing out right now oh, let me just do that okay so um this is just showing you the fall in non-resident workers because um you know obviously everybody went home uh, that needs to be turned around particularly for the agricultural industry you know they they're doing it pretty tough at the moment with having to uh, you know a lot of their crops are being spoiled because they simply haven't got people to to pick it and things like that um this is uh that's just as a percentage so you know we're talking about going from four percent down to less than two percent of non-resident workers um, this one here showed you in the in the thousands. So we're talking about around, uh, we were close to say 550,000 and we're now close to 2,000, 200,000. So massive, massive turn down there in uh, non-resident workers. And that is really what is fueling this, um, this uh, massive decrease that we've seen in unemployment, which is a good thing. But let's look at where it would be if we took all of that into account and we'd be up around the sevens. So um, it's still OK. We're still you know, in, in um, territory that is, is not that bad, uh, but it is something that we need to, to, to watch. We are heading in the right direction, so nothing to be concerned about. But this has a flow on effect when we start talking about interest rates. Because the Reserve Bank of Australia has come out and said that they are going to continue to run the country hot um, until, until unemployment is down into the fours. So low fours, they're actually saying. So the RBA is unlikely to raise interest rates ahead of schedule. They've come out and said that the RBA is still happy to run the, the economy hot. Um, to spearhead the economic recovery. And the RBA recognises we are just one outbreak away from another economic downturn. Now, are we going to experience that with Sydney getting out of control at the moment? I don't think so, um, but it is something to be watched. We've handled things pretty pretty well to date. Now, this is good news because this, this surpasses all the employment figures because this just shows you how dramatically their, our spending habits are up. So you can see here we had that massive downturn through COVID, but now we're spending that money. That is partly due to stimulus because we had a lot of money pour into the economy uh, through stimulus packages. And it didn't come out in loans like we spoke about for other countries. It came out in real money into, into real people's pockets and they were being encouraged to spend which they are. So you can see there how we've been tracking since 2014, and it's been a very ordinary story, really. Then we had a bit of a spike, then we had COVID, um, and then we've gone back into this up and down thing as we've gone into lockdown and out of lockdown and everything else. But that is really good news because it shows, um, it's an indicator of how well the economy is actually doing. This is the US, so that I just put through, through this in here to show you that the US is, is a very similar story. So uh, we're not alone in this one. This is, this is right across the board. And I think when you have something like a health scare, people start to think about things like, well, life's too short, let's get out there and do things. I mean, I certainly thought the same thing, um, not so much from COVID, but more from loss in my family. And uh, this is why we're taking this, this um, three month off to go sailing around the country, but I'm still gonna come to you with all of these updates. So, um, so don't fear about that. Um, the other thing here is the um, the PMI. Now this shows you, and I'll just draw, bring that chart up for you. This shows you as a percentage of uh, gross domestic product, how our, um, how our economy's been going. So this brings into play the activity in um, services and in manufacturing. And the thing that I'm really encouraged about here is our manufacturing arm and how, uh, you know, we are, we are into the positives when we, when we, um, about producing here in Australia. And obviously that's something that's been very close to my heart for a very long time. And it shows that more jobs are being created here in Australia and more jobs are going to be, um, you know, fueling more jobs and more jobs. It's, you know, it's, it's a never ending circle when you get to get onto this, 
uh, gravy train. And that's the manufacturing. So you can see there I've pulled out manufacturing. I think the next one here is oh, that's, unemployment. that's employment. Um, but that's the manufacturing composite. So you can see where we've gone from. But we're actually, if you look at the levels, we are higher from a manufacturing perspective than we were back in 2018, 2017 and 2016. Um, obviously, 19 and 20 were disastrous. Um, and we, you know, 2019 really saw us uh, become very dependent on uh, overseas manufacturing. And uh, that's had a massive, massive turnaround now, particularly with the, the little rift that we are having with China at the moment. Um, and that's flowing through into employment. So we've got the, the, the manufacturing sector doing, doing better, services sector doing better, and that's flowing through to our employment figures as well. Now, this really shows you across the board, the inner cities are dead. So even places like Adelaide that barely felt the, uh, the effects of COVID, their CBD still really, really suffered. Uh, I think the, the best of the lot there is probably Perth, and it's pretty dismal anyway. Um, you know, Brisbane, uh, Brisbane's not too bad. Sydney's, Sydney's down to 28% 20, uh, of what it was previously. Um, but look at Melbourne. Melbourne's 14% activity in the CBD as what it was previously. And this is why the Melbourne property figures are not showing the true picture, because you've got a massive oversupply in units um, in, in, in Melbourne. So when you combine the oversupply of units and apartments in, uh, in Melbourne, which a lot of that was taken up previously with um, overseas in, uh, students and things like that, and first migrants into Australia, um, but that's come into a, you know, a massive oversupply. And then you couple that with the fact that uh, the foot traffic is just down because people are working from home. Um, they're, they're not commuting as much. You know, people aren't going into the city to have a bit of a, you know, a woohoo time. Theatres are down, restaurants are down, all that kind of stuff. It has really killed the city. So 14% of the activity that it was pre-COVID. That's massive, and that is obviously uh, you know affecting Melbourne CBD. I think uh, from the figures I remember was uh, Sydney was twenty eight percent. So again, down. It's only places like Perth at forty five percent, Brisbane at forty percent. There's anywhere near what it was previously, but they're still down. So the CBDs are suffering. The Melbourne story, though, also is a little bit. Um, uh, it shows a different story when you look at the, the Melbourne property figures, because what it shows is that Melbourne uh, figures haven't grown that much. Well, that's really not true. The apartment market and the unit market, which as I say is an oversupply and particularly in the CBD, has gone down. Um, and that is pulling down the actual results of housing in Melbourne. Um, because the housing market in Melbourne tells a very different story. And I think when you when you take that into account, the figures in Melbourne would be much, much better. So let's move on. Let's talk about the stimulus, because I, I mentioned this before, the fact that, you know, we've had a massive stimulus um, uh, boost come into, into the economy last year, and that really saved us from a, a deepening recession. Where did it go? Now, I just want to put this into comparison because obviously to have that stimulus package, we went into debt. So this is our debt as a percentage of our GDP. And you can see we are at similar levels now. And this isn't just our story. This is the worldwide story. So across the world, um, the IMF has actually, the International Monetary Fund has actually separated out the uh, advanced economies, which obviously we fit into, with the emerging economies being those in you know um, third world countries and things like that. So you can see here that the debt level across the um, the advanced countries, the advanced economies, is the same as it was back in World War Two. It is higher than it was in World War One. Now that's not just total debt. This is as a percentage of the size of the economy. So as a percentage of gross domestic product. Uh, for the for the um, emerging economies, again, they're higher, not as as much perhaps as we are. Uh, you can see they're, they are oh, sorry, they're actually higher compared to where they were back in the 1940s. A lot of them weren't involved in the war um, or not to any large degree, whereas, uh, you know, the, the Western world, if you want to call it that, is um, was well and truly involved and a massive amount of debt went into funding that war. 
well, this is a health war. Um, and you can see the massive amounts of debt, but we were already very high. I mean, if you look at that last little bump up there that we've had as a result of COVID, um, that's what's pushed us up to World War II levels. But if you look at where we were previously, we were very high anyway. So there's a lot of theories around that about the fact that you know the whole world has increased its debt so there's a new there's a new world order if you like of debt level of acceptable debt level certainly the attitude around debt has been uh, has been massively changed i mean i think you know even the the, the hardcore anti debtors are, uh, are saying no we needed to have the debt to actually uh, to to bring the the economies and save the world economically and all of those other things but what it does mean is that there is a greater and greater divide because those who um, have been able to uh, to, to uh, benefit from those those high debt levels have been the wealthy. So the the wealthy have got richer out of this process. Um, and this just shows you across some of the countries there. Now I draw your attention to the top left. Uh, you can see there Australia is up among some of the the highest. Um, but, uh, you know, the United States is probably the biggest. They're followed by Canada. And then we fit in there with New Zealand and um, Japan and other countries there. Uh, when you look at Germany, UK, very similar levels. Singapore, Hong Kong, very similar levels. And then some of the Asian countries, much below that with, um, you know, South Korea and the like. And then you've got the, um, you know, the, the emerging countries. I don't think we wouldn't put China in the emerging countries, but China or Russia, but India, uh, Brazil, uh, you know, they're, they're at, a, at a much lower level. So that just puts it into perspective, um, you know, where, where we're at across the board from other countries as well. Where has it gone? This is the most encouraging thing, I think, because what it shows is that blue area there has gone in wages subsidy. So you can see where we sit. We sit, um, you know, towards the bottom of that list as to how much went out in stimulus packages. But you can see as a percentage of our size, or not even as a percentage of our size, compare us to any other country on that chart, you can see that we have put the most back into um, wage subsidies, back into people's hands in the form of jobs. Um, you know, and we've got, you know, bits and pieces in other areas like healthcare, a um, bit of liquidity support there, not much. Uh, unemployment benefits, again, not as much as we have in wage subsidies. Um, tr transfers, that's money directly to the housing, which is what the US is doing right now. It's just handing out money hand over fist, which I've never been a supporter of. I think it is much better to hand it out in the form of um, keeping people employed than, you know, paying them to, uh, you know, just here's, here's some money, you know, go and spend it. It doesn't work in the long term. But the, the, the grey areas there is other. Now, what that includes is a lot of loans. And you can see here uh, Germany, um, uh, United States, uh, United Kingdom, even New Zealand has had a lot of money go out in other other ways. Not so much New Zealand because that's actually covering a, a few other things there. But um, that that shows a lot of loans that were going out, and uh, of course those loans have to be repaid. So this is why the IMF is saying that Australia is set to um, recover better than the rest of the, the the Western world as a percentage of our GDP because we don't have the big loans that then have to be paid back. Um, this is the individuals paying back the loans. Obviously, we've got sovereign debt, which is really you know debt with our Reserve Bank of Australia, basically. Um, but we've also got that uh, you know that that most of it's gone back to the people, which is a great thing. Again, real income, you know, income has spiked through COVID in Australia, in Canada and the United States, and it's gone negative. Real household income has gone down in places like Germany, Spain and Sweden. Interesting when you talk about Sweden, because, you know, when the whole COVID thing started in, in Sweden, it was one of the countries that said, look, we're not going to impose lockdowns. We're not going to impose masks. Do what you like. Get it. Don't get it. We're going to keep our economy running. Uh, but even with that attitude, uh, the uh, the flow on effect has been one of the you know the households have suffered, and I think you know leaving it directly to the markets has meant that a lot of fear actually came into their markets. A lot of businesses closed, and consequently there was a, a much greater unemployment. So, you know, only time can see whether that was a good move or a bad move. Um, whereas Australia, Canada, United States all supported their uh, their economies hugely. 
this shows you um, that you know Australia has put a lot of their money back into investment recovery. Now this is good policy, and you can see there we're sitting at number five, um, whereas a lot of that money going back for uh, infrastructure spending and creating jobs and those sort of things, um, and that's good news because the more money going back into um, uh, you know, public investment, um, uh, training programs, uh, bridges, roads, all transport, all that kind of stuff, the better it, it augurs uh, for, uh, for the economy in the long term. Because uh, what it means is that it'll create more jobs and more, um, you know, uh, I'm a little bit saddened in the fact that a lot of that money hasn't gone into supporting manufacturing coming back to Australia, because, you know, I've said this many times, when you have a machine working to make widgets, call it whatever you like, when it when the industry is capital intensive, it doesn't matter whether it's being made in China or Vietnam or whether it's being made in Australia. The machine still has a very similar cost. Labor obviously is higher here. We've got a bit of higher electricity costs and things like that, but not not greatly. Um, you know, put the solars on the roof and other things, we can bring it back to being very comparable with anywhere else. And, uh, you know, and that's where our money needs to be, be going, putting back into capital intensive manufacturing back in this country. And that's what's going to make a massive difference. I said this, I think I said it a couple of weeks ago about the, um, you know, the um, uh, car industry here in Australia and how we could have saved the car industry. All we had to do was mandate that all government departments can only drive Australian made cars. That would have saved the industry. Did we do it? No. Stupid policy. Anyway, I'll get off that bandwagon. Um, just while I'm talking about this, I'll go on to the uh, the global housing boom that we're, we're experiencing because it's not just us, it's right across the board. I, I want to draw your attention to the fact that I am offering free um, one hour breakthrough sessions for you. So these breakthrough sessions are uh, with one of my advisors. There's only a few appointments this week. Um, so you can lock in and get that. Now, what they'll do is they will look at your circumstances. They will look at your goals, dreams, aspirations, and they'll talk to you about how we can help you achieve those goals. Uh, it's very important right now because we have a booming housing market. There is so much money to be made. I'm really excited about the amount of money that can actually be made right now. Um, but you've got to be making the right decisions. And the thing is, if you buy some properties that I've seen on the market right now, you're going to get hurt. It's going to go the other way. So there are people who are going to make a lot of money in the property market. And there's a lot of people that are going to lose money or just kind of make a little bit of money. So uh, this is your opportunity to step up and be one of those who really powers. In fact, in the next, say, three, four, five years, you can actually replace your income and you could build a portfolio that can support you and your, your family for the rest of your life. Imagine that. Imagine in, say, three, four years, you never had to work again, not a day in your life. Would you like that? Now, look, I'm not saying work's bad. In fact, I love work. I love what I do. But what it means is you can have choices. You can have choices around what you do. You can have choices around how you spend your days. And I think that's something that we all really want deep down, regardless of of what you, um, you know, how much you earn or don't earn or anything else. So really, I'm very serious about this. Now is the time to act. In fact, you know, last year was the time to act. But the sooner you get going on this stuff, the sooner you learn what you need to be doing and how you can power through this from your circumstances. And that's really what my advisors are going to be helping you with. So grab one of those appointments. There's only a few this week grab one of those appointments. They're an hour long, they're free. And all you've got to do is go to iloverealestate.tv forward slash questions forward slash. And that will get you, um, if there's any appointments left, it'll get you uh, one of those free breakthrough sessions. Okay, let's get back to the global housing market. What's happening on an international basis? Well, one of the things that hap is happening, I mentioned this in the in what I was going to cover, is the Swedish Prime Minister loses confidence vote over housing crisis. So, as I said before, even somewhere like Sweden, where uh, they said, do what you like, you know, get it, don't get it, don't wear masks, wear masks, do what you like, it's really backlashed even there where uh, the uh, the housing market is is really um, getting to, uh, you know, they're skyrocketing and that's causing affordability issues and that's causing a lack of confidence in the government. 
In the US, this is the percentage change in house prices um, over the last, uh, uh, you know, on a month by uh, year by year basis, beg your pardon. So you can see their massive, massive turnaround, even higher. Um, you know, they, they had that massive drop. See, they didn't really have a massive housing boom all through from 2013 through to 2018. And this is why, you know, when I spoke on stage back in 2011 and I said, we are in for a housing boom, Americans didn't understand that. You know, they'd come out here to try and sell gloom and doom and tell everybody to sell all their properties. And I was this lone voice back then on stage saying, no, you need to keep your properties because we're in for one hell of a ride because our economies are very different. And um, uh, the attitude towards property is very different. Americans are very much stocks and share focused. They're not they're not property focused like we are here in Australia. Uh, but you know it's become that way as a result of COVID. So you can see there a massive turnaround uh, in their house pricing. Again, staying in the US, you can see buying conditions have definitely gone down. So it's definitely a seller's market. Um, and uh, this is, uh, you know, buying conditions as a result of, uh, of house prices. So telling the same story. Fannie Mae's come out and said there is a massive differential there. Uh, you can see, and it's again, they're basically telling the same story. It's a seller's market. Prices are going up. Um, what this shows is the, the house pricing. So you can see there the median house pricing in the US is much, much lower than we have here. Uh, of the, obviously, they've got a much bigger area and they take into account all of the regional areas and other things as well. But even with all of that taken into account, the uh, home prices from beginning of COVID to where they are now in the US are 24% up on where they were pre-COVID. And the problem is supply. This is, again, the same story, same thing that I, I was talking about here in Australia. You can see there that there is a massive, massive undersupply. Um, in fact, the supply in 2021 is 37% down on previous years. So that's what's causing the price increase. It's the same story. And what that means is it's going to last a while because it takes a long time to bring supply up to meet demand. It's not going to happen quickly, particularly in places like Australia, where we've had so much pent up demand as a result of APRA and COVID and all the other things. So what's happening here in Australia with respect to property uh, pricing? Look at this. Now, this is the entry price. So this isn't the, the median, it isn't the average, it isn't any of those things. It shows you what the entry price is in Sydney, and across the other capital cities. So Sydney is at, at $770,000. It's obviously the highest. Now, what it's also saying is it typically takes you seven years and one month in order to be able to save to get into the Sydney market. Melbourne is six years at uh, six years and one month at 631,000. Brisbane is only four years at 429,000. Adelaide four years as well at 405. Perth is three years and seven months at 395,000. Hobart is four years and 11 months at 455,000. Uh, Darwin is coming in at three years at 440,000. And Canberra is up at six years at just under 700,000, 691,000. So um, that's, you know, that that's a considerable amount of time. It puts it in a different perspective, doesn't it? To be able to, uh, to work out what you need to be doing and how long you need to be saving to get into the median house price in, um, in any one of those cities. The great thing about getting yourself educated though, is that all of that goes out the window because you can do a deal right now. You can do a deal without any money. You don't have to have a deposit to get into the property market. And this is where the learning comes into play. There's lots and lots of deals that you can do to accelerate that. I mean, I've had people living in Sydney who within a year were able to, who couldn't afford to buy in Sydney at all. They went off and they did a deal elsewhere with rent investing got themselves a manufactured growth strategy. Uh, this is through education, through I Love Real Estate, that within a year they were back in Sydney being able to buy a, a, a property in Sydney, which again was a manufactured growth strategy that made them nearly $450,000. Now that really set them up. So that's two years to go from can't afford a deposit, can't save, got no money to, um, you know, to having equity in their homes uh, in Sydney in, in over $450,000. And, you know, that went on to, to get them into other deals and other things. So this is where, this is the normal story that you're seeing here. 
But the real story is getting educated and working out how you can do this right now with or without any, um, you know, having to get into savings or having deposits or any other things. Uh, this is the, uh, the um, index into uh, how many buyers are looking at properties right now. And you can see there, uh, you know, they're, they're up, they're buoyant, they're way above where we were back in COVID times. Um, so people are getting very serious. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great thing to see. My truth bomb for the week, my truth bomb for the week is that ego feeds on problems. So if you don't keep your ego busy, it will create problems to be busy with. You see, there's a law that, uh, a law of one of the universal laws, and it's the law of substitution. And basically the mind, the subconscious mind cannot turn off. Uh, it is working all the time. So if you don't give it something to work on, it will find something to work on. And it's usually all the little petty little things that are going on in your life and all the little dramas and whatever else, and it blows them out of proportion. So keep it busy. I love this quote by Tim Allen. He says, the ego is like a kid in the basement. In the basement. Um, it's best to keep him busy. <laughs> Otherwise, he's going to run riot. So set those goals. Get your subconscious working on on the goals to be able to uh, to solve the problem, uh, so that the ego is under control. It's got something to do, and it's not interfering with your wealth and self sabotaging you. So where to from here? The next step for you is to take up one of those sixty minute real estate breakthrough sessions with one of my advisors. They are free. And it, uh, you know, there's a bit of a quote there about great success requires immediate action. So now is your opportunity to take that immediate action. All you've got to do is to go to iloverealestate.tv forward slash questions forward slash and, uh, you know, make that happen. Take up one of the appointments. They're free. We'll, we'll talk to you about your goals and what you want to do and what you want to achieve, how you can go about doing that and how we can help you with that. So jump on one of those appointments. I hope you're enjoying my uh, my weekly updates and what it all means. Um, I am an accountant, I am an economist, and uh, you know I'm really trying to bring you the hardcore facts so that you've got some certainty around your decision-making processes. So that's it from me this week. I hope you've enjoyed my session this week and I'll be back again to talk to you next week. Bye now.